professionals refer to aspects of therapeutic communication as therapeutic lying. This term stirs up some negative connotations. However, the Alzheimer's Association advocates this practice to avoid distress. They state that caregivers should avoid harsh facts. For example, if the person with dementia is asking for a parent who has died and the caregiver reminds them that their mother or father is no longer living, the patient with dementia may feel they are hearing the news of their parent's death for the first time. For our students who may be preparing to work with patients who have Alzheimer's and other dementias, it can be helpful to consider the life story of the people they are caring for. Before they were an agitated patient with dementia, they may have been a young professional, a devoted parent, or a fabulous joke teller. The person sitting in the chair beside them remembers. They may not know how to tell you or describe the person they remember or express how they are mourning the parts of their parent or spouse that they have already lost. Today, you are going to encounter just one caregiver story. This one is special because the caregiver can communicate about it in a way others might not, through writing poetry. We'll have a short interview, and then he will read some of his poems. Dr. Robert Hamblin is Professor Emeritus of English here at Southeast Missouri State University, where he taught for a school record of 50 years and was the founding director of our Center for Faulkner Studies. He married Kay Smith in 1960, a week after they graduated from college at Delta State University. They were wed in Kay's home church, Candler's Chapel Baptist Church in Mississippi. They taught school for two years in Baltimore, Maryland. Then they returned to Mississippi so he could pursue graduate studies in American literature at Ole Miss, and she became an elementary school teacher at Batesville. He joined the faculty at Southeast in 1965. As a research scholar, Dr. Hamblin is an internationally recognized authority on the life and writings of William Faulkner. In 1978, Dr. Hamblin met Louis Daniel Brodsky, a St. Louis businessman who was the owner of a world-class collection of William Faulkner books, manuscripts, photographs, and other artifacts. Over the next several years, the two men worked together to produce Faulkner, a comprehensive guide to the Brodsky collection, and other books, articles, exhibits, and public lectures based on the materials in the Brodsky collection. In 1988, Southeast Missouri State University acquired the Brodsky Collection and created our Center for Faulkner Studies. To date, Dr. Hamblin has authored or edited 18 books on Faulkner. He has presented seminars and lectures on Faulkner in England, the Netherlands, Japan, China, Taiwan, and Romania, as well as throughout the United States. And in 2005, he led the online discussion of As I Lay Dying and served as the general consultant for Oprah Winfrey's Summer of Faulkner. There's no prizes under your chair, though. Oprah's not here today. In 2003, Dr. Hamblin and Kay moved from the small split-level house they had lived in for 38 years into a huge, deteriorating Victorian Queen Anne mansion in downtown Cape Girardeau. They restored the house, researched its significant local history, and succeeded in placing the property on the National Register of Historic Places. Dr. Hamblin wrote the book, This House, This Town, about the experience of restoration. And his wife, Kay, wrote a book entitled Finding Julia, about the notable women who have been associated with the house over the years. Dr. Hamblin and Kay have two children, two granddaughters, and two twin great-granddaughters who are three years old. Two years ago, Kay was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Hamblin has written a book of poetry entitled Darkness Descending about his experiences as her caregiver, which we will be discussing and reading from today. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robert Hamblin.
All right, I think we're hooked up. Thank you, Brooke. <laughs> You're welcome. Hello, folks. <laughs> so first we're going to take a little stroll down memory lane. And I was wondering if you could tell us how you and Kay met. We met in high school. Uh, I transferred to her school when I was uh, an 11th grader. And uh, we graduated from high school together. We graduated from college together. We attended graduate school together. So uh, we've been together quite a while. Quite a while. When, uh, when you met her, when did you get that feeling that uh, you were meant for each other? Well, uh, <laughs> she says it was love at first sight. Oh. But I think it was uh, really just curiosity. <laughs> uh, I was the new kid in town, and uh, uh, she knew all those boys she'd been going to school with for 10 years and wasn't about to fall in love with any of them. Uh, so uh, I, 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 she says uh, love at first sight. But I do remember uh, seeing her that first week. Uh, we were in homeroom together, and I noticed her. And, uh, it took me a little longer to, to uh, get involved with Kay, but uh, I was, uh, she was a cut above my station. <laughs> uh, she was an honor student and uh, a band majorette and uh, homecoming queen and, uh, and her family, a very substantial family in, in, in Boonville. I was a poor kid, insecure in high school probably because of our circumstances, mm -hmm. poverty and uh, near poverty, genteel poverty, we mm -hmm. would say. So it took me a while to screw up my courage to, uh, <laughs> and actually it was uh, some of our mutual friends who arranged our first date. So. But we started dating when we were seniors mm -hmm. and uh, been together ever since. Well, that's a pretty long history to have together. What are some of you had to highlight, just some of the favorite things that you've done together? Well, we love to travel. Faulkner's taken care of that for us, as you noted. Uh, Kay is a voracious reader. She's always read more books than I, I do. Uh, so we, we always enjoyed that together. We love uh, plays uh, here in Rose Theater mm -hmm. and the River Campus. Uh, until she became ill, we saw most of those performances. Uh, uh, the first semester I taught in London, I think we saw 33 plays mm -hmm. uh, in the West End, uh, including all of Lloyd Webber's musicals. Mm -hmm. So we, we love theater, we love travel. And uh, one of the highlights of our travel was taking our grandkids when mm -hmm. they were 10 and 12 at the time. We took them to London and Paris, and that was a, that was a great trip. So. Wow, that's wonderful. So with all of this time together, all of these great trips, um, when was it that you began to notice that something about Kay was changing and you suspected the first signs of Alzheimer's disease? Well, she'd always taken care of uh, the, the money for us. Mm -hmm. After she had retired, I was still teaching, and uh, so I just took the money home to her, and uh, she paid the bills, and and I looked after our budget, uh, and I noticed uh, some bills were getting lost, and I had a call from our insurance agent, agent and uh, the insurance payment on our house was overdue. Mm. Uh, so misplacing things, uh, and, and so then I had to start doing the business uh, matters. And, and then I think driving, uh, she, she could drive down the road, even and get from one side of Cape to another there for a while, but, but she was having trouble with the controls, uh, setting mm -hmm. the mirror, uh, doing the, uh, the uh, turn signals, all, mm -hmm. all of the gadgets. On, mm -hmm. She was having trouble with that and very soon had to give up driving altogether. Mm -hmm. Then it was, uh, she, she, she loved writing. She wrote a lot unpublished material actually for her grandkids, just mm -hmm. her own family story and her own childhood on the farm in Mississippi. Uh, and she hoped to write about this. Mm -hmm. She actually tried. To, and I would set up a file and help her log on and, uh, uh, you know, I'd go back later and look at what she had written and, uh, it, it, you know, it, it was uh, incoherent. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so she, she got to where she couldn't use the computer, and couldn't use a cell phone. Uh, so th those, were the, those were the things that were the first signals mm -hmm. that uh, uh, we, we had the problem. And she'd been an elementary teacher, so like you said, she'd yes. been reading and writing all of her life. Yes. And so that was pretty substantial. So what led you to the diagnosis then? Well, I had a friend actually on campus here whose mother-in-law uh, had Alzheimer's, and uh, he recommended that we go to the Department of Neurology at Washington University in mm -hmm. St. Louis. Uh, they had been a great help to his family. And that's where we went uh, two years ago. That's where we got the diagnosis. We go periodically there for checkups, mm -hmm. go again next month. Mm -hmm. uh, they're wonderful. Um, but they don't have much good news for us. Mm -hmm. Were you hoping in the beginning that maybe there would be some good news? That they'd say, actually, this isn't what you think it is? Well, you, you, uh, I'm told, I've read, uh, any time you have a traumatic experience, you, you go through phases. Uh, first, you hope for the miracle cure. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you, you come to the point of acceptance. It takes a while to get mm -hmm. there. Uh, in some situations, I'm told, you, you actually come to a point of celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I had a, a CPA friend in Cape uh, who had a heart attack in his 40s. He told me later that a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to him in his life mm -hmm. because uh, he was working all the time, making a lot of money, didn't have time for his family, mm -hmm. never took a vacation. The heart attack made him slow down, of course, mm -hmm. and he discovered life outside of work mm -hmm. and money. Yeah. Uh, I guess Kay and I have come to the point of acceptance. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever arrive at celebration. celebration. So with that, with that acceptance, what do you think is the hardest part of being her caregiver? I think it would be easier if it was someone you did love, mm -hmm. know for all those years. Uh, it, it's uh, just daily you, you watch this person you've lived with and loved and traveled with and shared with uh, just gradually disappear. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we can't have conversations. Uh, the extent of our conversations now is who are you and mm -hmm. where are we? And, mm -hmm. Those questions get asked several times a day. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> I think for when you're caring for a loved one, uh, it's the emotion, and it's doubly tough, I think. Mm -hmm. It might, I don't know, it wouldn't be easy, but it might be a little easier if I were caring for a stranger, you know. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's, it's very difficult. And, and from, from my side of it, the, I think the hardest thing is, is learning patience. Uh, Kay can still do a lot of things for herself, but, but she can't process mm -hmm. the information very quickly, whether mm -hmm. it's getting dressed or whatever. It takes her a long time to accomplish even a simple task. And as with a child, you know, my tendency is to jump in there and do it quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you can tie the kid's shoe, but he needs to learn to do it for himself. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, learning patience, uh, and then what you were talking about, the uh, therapeutic lying. Uh, you, you Initially, when they make false statements, you try mm -hmm. to explain to them, uh, correct, correct her. Uh, eventually, you just accept, uh, and, and it, it doesn't do any good to contradict. You can't mm -hmm. explain. Uh, so you just have, it just creates more problems if you try mm -hmm. to argue with, mm -hmm. with uh, so, but, but getting to that point has been very difficult for me mm -hmm. because, I, you know, we've both been such independent people and yes. active and involved and, and uh, you know, our life, uh, you know, we've had a great life together. I, uh, you know, whatever, whatever happens next, uh, 
we've lived a charmed and blessed life. You know, we've been married almost 60 years. We travel the world, uh, great family, successful careers. We, we have no complaints. And Kay has a great sense of humor. I, I mean, she, <laughs> she, she woke up in the middle of the night, a couple of nights ago, right in the middle of the night, sat up in bed and said, Happy New Year. <laughs> I wasn't about to contradict that. Uh, so we, we're, we're accepting of this, uh, yeah. it, it's, uh, but it's uh, the isolation, the loneliness, and of course that's worse for her than for me. Yes. But just not being able to get out and about and, and do things, it's, uh, it's, it's such a radical shift for us yeah. because we've always been so involved and so active. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's tough. Oh, you were always on the go, mm -hmm. and uh, her sense of humor is one of the things, I hope I don't spoil one of the poems you were going to read, but she, I imagine it was in the relatively early stages, she looked at you and she goes, well, look at it this way, I get to sleep with a different man every night. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> well, I do have a poem about that. It's not one I'd chosen to read today, but, uh, but you know, my actual name is Bobby. Mm -hmm. My professional name is Robert. My friends call me Bob. Uh, and my students call me a lot of things. <laughs> uh, but she gets confused about which one mm -hmm. of those uh, I am. And uh, on one of those occasions when I was three different people to her, uh, she told me that she could sleep <laughs> with a different man every night. And, uh, I just found it remarkable that she <clears throat> had that little sense of humor about that. And so, you know, speaking of the poetry, how did you begin writing about this journey that you were on? Well, I'm always writing something. Mm -hmm. And uh, literature of any kind, for me, it's, it's, uh, whether you teach it, read it, write it, uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot unless it's personal. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to, you have to, make it personal. Uh, James Ball, a famous African-American writer, said, you, you write out of only one thing, your own personal experience. And of course, everybody has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. I, in, in writing workshops, I always encourage people to write their story. Uh, so I've been writing a long time uh, about family, grandkids, my involvement with Chris Rieger and the Faulkner Center, uh, most all of my writing is in one way or another very personal. Mm -hmm. And um, this was an extension of that. I, uh, Kay usually goes to bed pretty early. She's very tired. And uh, she's usually in bed by eight o'clock or so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the, really the only time I have to myself mm -hmm. during the day. So from eight till 10 or 11, mm -hmm. midnight, whatever, depending how well the writing is going, yeah. I, that's when I do my reading and writing is, is at night after she is uh, in bed asleep. Mm -hmm. um, my study is next door to the bedroom, so I'm right there beside her, but if, uh, if she needs me, but uh, I, I have that time. And that's, that's when I wrote these poems at night after she was, had gone to bed. I did not show them to her or share them with her for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was afraid it would be too painful. Um, she has now read some of the poems. She's heard me read them. Although sometimes in programs like this, uh, when she hears me read, she, she sometimes thinks I'm writing about some other person, mm -hmm. not herself, mm -hmm. which is good, I suppose, in mm -hmm. some ways. But I, 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 and I, all writing is a form of escape. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a form of control. Uh, you know, when we're young, we, like maybe till age 50, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we think we're in control of everything in our lives and we can make things happen. And, but as we get older and, of course, as we become ill, elderly, and have illness, and disease, uh, we realize we're, we're not as much in control of things as we thought we were, probably never were. But when you write, you, you, 
you know, it used to be a blank piece of paper and a typewriter. Now it's a screen, a blank screen. Uh, you start with that blank screen and you see what you can make. And, it, it, and you feel uh, like you're in control of the creative process. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the attractions of creativity. You, 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 you're in control of things. You make things happen the way you want them to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and then you see it unfold. It start with a line, a word, it grows. And so I think uh, one thing that motivated me to write the poems was uh, what motivates me to do maybe all the writing I do. It's a form of escape. Uh, mm -hmm. You just get away from everything and look at that blank screen and the keyboard and try to make something happen. And that's a fun process. But the other, the other thing was as I began to write about this, it was a way of, uh, of remembering. Mm -hmm. uh, as I wrote the poems about her Alzheimer's, I was al always remembering things we had done, things she had said. It, it, was, a, it was a way of uh, my celebrating uh, our life together, mm -hmm. which is ironic because as I'm remembering uh, these things, she's losing memory of those same events. Mm -hmm. So it's very ironic. But that contradiction, my remembering, her forgetting, uh, that contradiction uh, makes the memories more precious, I think. Mm. So there's a lot of memory in, in these poems, and that, that was therapeutic for me. It seems like you know, that idea of control is very interesting because so much of Alzheimer's is out of your control and you spend mm -hmm. most of the day in that world, but then to have those three or four hours at night to be in control of something. Um, you mentioned that it took a while to share them with Kay. What do you hope well, uh, you're giving to the world by sharing them with other people? Well, uh, the first thing I'm giving them is, is her wish because she mm -hmm. wanted to write these, uh, the story and couldn't. I asked her if I could and in the early days she would share with me uh, ideas, and uh, she wanted me to do this. Uh, we've heard from a good number of people who have said the book is very helpful to them. Mm -hmm. uh, one chaplain uh, wrote me that, uh, you know, so much of the discussion of Alzheimer's is, is scientific, mm -hmm. uh, medical. Uh, the chaplain wrote me and he said, this, this is the story uh, not from a uh, medical or scientific perspective, but, but from the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, several people have told us they've found the book very helpful. I also hope uh, people buy the book because <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the royalties uh, from the sale of the book will go to Alzheimer's. They are going to Alzheimer's Association. Mm -hmm. And we will have that book for sale in the lobby after uh, the presentation today. I have a prize for students. Oh, well, <laughs> there you go. Well. With that, without further ado, how about if you read some of those poems for us? I'm honored. All right. Thank you. They ask you to draw designs they place before you. They question you about what you've done the last few weeks, trips you've taken, movies and TV shows you've watched, visits from family members or friends. Later they will query me on the same topics, checking my answers against yours. I know that you are frightened that I am not with you. I am too. For the past several months, we've been joined together like Siamese twins. 
How strange that something this awful, this foreboding, has brought us closer together, maybe closer than we've ever been. Another kind of winter. The trees along the river have all gone brown and lifeless, mere ghosts of their summer selves. The river itself is slate, as gray and overcast as the sunless sky. The leaves rustle under our feet as Moo and I walk through Courthouse Park. It is winter. Any day now, we will have snow. Kay no longer walks with us, but she too knows the change of season. But her winter is colder and far less kind with no promise of spring to follow. I wish you could see inside my head and know what it is like, she tells me, crying again. I cry too, as I watch the words and memories slip away one by one. In my dreams, I see her falling into a deep, dark pit, and I cannot pull her back. She's drowning in a sea of forgetfulness and silence, and I cannot swim to her. Do you see it too, Moo? Sometimes I think you do. Tonight, as last, you will lie beside her on the couch, your head in her lap, patiently waiting for her to pat your head and say your name. Playing the piano. It's the piano your parents gave you when you were a little girl. You've played it ever since. And you taught our two children and both our granddaughters to play it. Now our twin great-granddaughters, when they come to visit, sit on your lap and bang the keys. You don't play much anymore. And when you do, it's the simple pieces you learned as a child with frequent mistakes and restarts. Listening from another room with heart as broken as your mistaken notes, I imagine Liszt, Schubert, Chopin, and recall how once your music filled every room of the house. Color slides. For the first time in years, I dig in the back of the closet and pull out the old Kodak Calvacade projector and a large box filled with trays of slides. After checking to see if the lamp still works, I place the projector on a bedside table and aim it at the pull-down window shade across the room. Looking through the box of slides, I choose a tray labeled California 1977 and load it into the projector. Then I go downstairs to tell Kay I have a surprise I want to show her. Back upstairs, I set the projector on automatic feed, and together we watch scenes of a magical summer from our past flashing one by one on the makeshift screen. The campus at Irvine, where I did postdoctoral study. The beach, where you often took Laurie and Stephen when I was in class the swimming party at my niece's condo, the San Diego Zoo, Huntington Library and Gardens, the mission at San Juan Capistrano. I am greatly surprised and happy that you remember many of these, even recalling incidents we had failed to capture with the camera. In those days, some of our friends were beginning to record their family's memories in video but I always favored still photographs. I still do, even more today, as I sit here beside you, time frozen in place, unmoving and unchanging in its innocence, with no allowance or even hint of the dark days that may follow. Dancing. Kay wants to dance. 
All our years together, I've refused the dance lessons she's wanted us to take. But tonight, I agree to dance with her. She remembers that our first date was to our high school sweetheart ball. I remind her that she wore a pink party dress and the baby orchid I gave her, and I wore a white sport coat and bow tie. We danced the slow numbers and watched others bop. Tonight in our bedroom, I put a Kenny G CD on the player and we wobble over the floor like Hawthorne's doddering old fools pretending to be young again. You laugh for the first time all day and tell me you love me. I say, I love you too. And silently curse myself for having denied you anything you've ever wished for. London Poems. Last night I read to Kay from the book of London Poems. She helped me find and encouraged me to write. We read of things we did, places and people we saw, the joy and happiness we shared. She remembered some of them. But I skipped the poem about her mother. Our first time in London, we spoke to Mrs. Smith over a telephone line cluttered with white noise and static. The next time, 10 years later, via satellite, the line was clear, but her mind was cloudy and confused. She was in a place we never want to be, I wrote, but now we are there. Biblical. Last night I dreamed of Gomer, who left her loving husband for a life of prostitution. My wife has proven unfaithful too, but it's not her own doing. She has not left me for a lustier lover or a better man. She has been kidnapped and raped by a monster beyond description a devil from the deepest pit. Like Hosea, I go in search of Kay, looking in every room of the house, on every street, and in every alleyway of the town. The story does not tell us, but I know that Gomer does not come back. Our lovers, once gone, never return, or if so, only for another day or two, and we are left alone, forsaken, in a large house, in an empty bed, waiting for mercy that never comes. Faith in God. Have faith in God, the old hymn compels. We've sung it since childhood and believed it. But does not faith require a conscious mind, a deliberate and intentional will to believe? How can Kay maintain a faith in anything she cannot conceive or even name? I say her prayers for her, addressing the God she once loved and worshipped. Buttons. First it was names and words, then the computer and the cell phone. Now as I watch you try to dress yourself, it's buttons and zippers you struggle with. I try to be patient as I would with a child, knowing you need to do this for yourself. Sometimes you can, and I revel in your success, telling myself that you're getting better. More often I have to finish the task for you. You always smile and say thank you, and I turn quickly away so you will not see my tears. Time. Live in the moment, we're told, as if that were the secret to a fulfilling life. But victims of Alzheimer's live only 
in the moment, shut off from their past, unaware of the future, locked in the prison of the present. Watching and conversing with Kay, I am reminded that time is a continuum, that every present moment also contains the past and the future, that our very identity is defined by a perception of time as indivisible, a oneness that cannot be separated. Amputate an arm or a leg, and you are still you. Sever time, and you're nobody. And the final poem in the book, What I Miss the Most. You at the piano or organ, your hands moving over the keys, your music flowing throughout the house. You sitting on the couch, occasionally nodding the latest novel by Pat Conroy or Ann Tyler in your lap. You on your hands and knees in your flower garden, pulling weeds or planting a new patch of salvia or marigolds. You at the computer, writing the story of your childhood for your granddaughters. You accompanying me, hand in hand, on our long walks to the river and back. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is the part where we open it up for questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and then I'll repeat it to make sure everybody hears it and that we got it correctly. And then Dr. Hamblin or I can, can answer that for you. Does anyone have any questions? I know we have a, yes, here we go. What was your favorite song to dance to? <laughs> uh, when I took her to the sweetheart ball I didn't know how to bop <laughs> but a friend taught me later and uh, we always like to dance to Elvis you know <laughs> anything by Elvis would do other questions I know we have students in gerontology and calm disorders. There's a question from calm disorders from Misty. Oh, over there. Oh, okay, yes. Hi, this is Desmond Renault. Just a second, I'm going to share with you. First of all, thank you for sharing a beautiful story with this audience. And um, I'm a specialist in gerontology as well, and I know um, it's a very person with the journey with family members, but I've also had the patient for a number of years. What kind of caregiving support do you have in your home and what are you considering for the future? What kind of support? Yeah, for caregiving. Uh, Laurie, our daughter, and Stephen, our son, uh, both live in Cape. In fact, Laurie is sitting with uh, Kay now while I come here. Uh, they're, they're both available. Uh, Kaylee, uh, one of the granddaughters, is also in Cape. So, so I have family members uh, who, who uh, help out a lot. Anytime I need help, they, one of them is available usually to come. Uh, our church, our pastor, wonderful pastor, and our church, your friends at church, uh, they're all very supportive, very helpful. Many of them come to visit. Uh, Friends from the university, of course. Uh, we attended uh, a couple of sessions at, at Southeast Hospital for Alzheimer's uh, support group, but uh, that turned out to be more disturbing to Kay. I, I think I might benefit from such, but uh, 
it, it wasn't good for her. You know, she knows where she is. What's the point in listening to other stories about people who are as, as bad off or worse than she? And so I didn't take her back to those sessions, but uh, I suspect such sessions might be helpful to me. Uh, we go back to St. Louis uh, next month to see Dr. Snyder. A whole team of doctors there uh, diagnosed her and worked with her. Uh, we stay in touch, uh, telephone, uh, website. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, we, we have plenty of friends and family uh, who help us. Uh, I didn't read one of the poems about Stephen, our son, uh, renovating uh, the third floor. Uh, it's, it's a studio apartment presently, but he's added a kitchenette. Uh, he's remodeling the bedroom, the bathroom, uh, and all that's in preparation of, of a, a live-in caregiver in case we, we, we need that. Uh, as we look further ahead, uh, Kay wants to stay in our home as long as we can. Uh, she can still climb the steps with my assistance. I could put in a lift for her, but she needs the exercise, climbing the steps. She doesn't get much exercise. Now that it's warmer weather, uh, we walk around the courthouse park. She can't get that far usually, but uh, around the yard and uh, look at the flowers. And so she, she gets some exercise, not enough. Um, but uh, again, I. I may have to put in a lift at some point for her to negotiate the stairs. Uh, she wants to stay in the house as long as she can, as we can, uh, but we know that's probably not feasible for much longer. Uh, I have told her wherever she goes, I will go with her. If that means going to into a a nursing home, we'll sell the house, uh, we'll downsize, I'll move with her. Uh, uh, one of the fears you have at this stage, you know, men usually die before women in our culture. And, uh, you know, the, the, the slightest illness or <laughs> a headache, uh, uh, pain, I, I worry about my health, uh, I become kind of obsessed with it actually. Uh, because I fear that I might die before she does. And though we have loving family, I, I, uh, I, I don't want Kay being cared for by strangers. I, I want to do that as long as I'm physically able, and I will do that. I will move in with her if she has to go to a nursing home, and I'll be there with her as long as I can. Uh, and in preparation of that, you know, we, we've done power of attorney. Uh, we've done uh, all the uh, health uh, directives, shared those with our financial advisors, our doctors, uh, you, you know, all those things that, that any elderly couple eventually has to do. We picked out our grave site in Cape, not out on the highway, we, we like close to where we lived for years. So we picked sites in the older cemetery. We'd, we'd do the old Larimer Cemetery, but they won't let people be buried there anymore. But we wanted to be in downtown Cape, not out on the highway. And it's pretty close to where she used to walk the dog every day. It's a very familiar place. Uh, so we've taken care of all of those arrangements and I'm beginning to, uh, I haven't been able to work much on that old house the last uh, few years and an old house is like elderly people, it needs a lot of attention. And uh, So if you drive by it today, you'll see that a uh, portion of the upstairs balcony has been removed, the rail, so that they can repair the leak uh, on the balcony over the, over the porch. So I'm having to do some upgrades and repairs to the house uh, because uh, soon we may have to put it on the market and it needs to be in the best condition it can be in. So we have, we have a good support system in place. We have good doctors. 
great friends and family. Uh, and we, we both know, you know, uh, whatever, whatever happens, uh, we, we've, we have no complaints. Kay and I, you know, we've been married next month, 59 years. I've known her longer than that. Uh, we've had a wonderful life. All the travel we've done. I, I grew up on a Civil War battlefield in northeast Mississippi, Bryce's Crossroads. My parents had the general store there at the crossroads. My dad had a fourth grade education. My mother never graduated from high school. I was the first in my family to go to college, the first to go to graduate school, get a PhD. There have been some others since. I'm proud of those. But uh, growing up as a boy in northeast Mississippi in genteel poverty, you, you know, uh, I, I, would, I would spend the night in town with my friends. I, I would never invite my friends to spend the night with me out in the country. I think I was uh, unfair to them. But we didn't have indoor plumbing. Had that outhouse out behind the house. and My friends lived in town and they had a nice house and a nice bathroom. and. I just, I was kind of ashamed, I guess, growing up in many ways, very insecure. Poverty does that to people. And ours was not severe poverty. I can't imagine the scars that real poverty causes to our citizens. And yet, as a culture, a nation, we don't seem to care much about that. So I grew up in genteel poverty. I never wanted for anything. I didn't have the nicest clothes. But, but anyway, when I was growing up as a boy there in northeast Mississippi, I loved to read. I always daydreamed about going somewhere else. But I never dreamed I could have the life that I've had. And Kay, fortunately, uh, loved to travel. And we, you know, we've, we've seen every state except one. We've been in 49, we, with the kids growing up, we always took camping vacations. And Kay and I have been in every state except Alaska. We had a trip planned there, but then she became ill and we never, never got to make that trip. Uh, last long trip we made was to Key West. I drove all the way to Key West a couple of years ago because she wanted to see Miami. And <laughs> so we just drove on to Key West. Hemingway House was nice. I didn't care much for the rest of it. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, we, we've been so fortunate. We've seen, seen all of this country, I think 13 foreign nations we've traveled in, lived in some of them while I taught Japan, Taiwan. London is Kay's favorite city. When she was younger and uh, I was teaching over there occasionally, I, I always worried about her meeting some man who would offer to move her to England. <laughs> I think she'd have left me in a heartbeat if she could have uh, lived in, in England. She's an Anglophile, and uh, uh, we, we miss that. But we, we've had such a charmed and blessed life. Uh, we, it was, we have no complaints, and we know we have, probably have some tough times ahead of us, but uh, we'll deal with those with the help of uh, family and friends. Misty. What advice would you give to future professionals when they're working with people with the same diagnosis? Well, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm still learning. Uh, some days I'm not very good at it. Uh, but I, I, think, I think the hardest part is the loneliness, the isolation, uh, and and they, I, I know people who go into that line of work. Uh, they they have great empathy, great ability to love, nurture. Uh, but 
you have to show a lot of love. I, I don't know how you, I don't know how uh, it's, uh, and it's not fair to the victims of Alzheimer's, you know, to be put in places, uh, institutions, or be in homes where they're sort of cast aside and not loved. Uh, strangers can provide that. But uh, the capacity to, to feel love and empathy, that, I mean, that's, that's the first requirement, I think. And it's uh, my greatest fear for her is that she would in some way be found in a situation where she would not know that kind of care. Uh, and, and I know I, I know I, I don't help myself or, or my health uh, by being obsessed about being there with her. I, I really don't want to leave her. I don't I don't trust her being with other people. I uh, that's something I've got to learn because for my own health, uh, it's a very lonely world, and I I don't know. I don't know how caregivers do it. I'm doing the best I can, and I'm learning, but I'm not very good at it. All right. It's 1 o'clock, friends. Let's give Dr. Hamlin one more round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. If you would like to purchase the book of poetry, it's going to be for sale in the Rose Lobby. Uh, and Dr. Hamblin will also autograph your copy for you if you like. Thanks again for coming out to the Health Communication webinar. And if you need to sign in for class, please see Professor Misty Tillman. She's all the way in the back, black cardigan, red uh, shirt.